Hello, I'm Nigel Griffiths so of Wigan Power Systems Advanced Technologies Board in IBM Europe. In this video we'll be looking at the new features of PowerVC 132 that became available in December 2016. If you prefer a written description of what came out then Rebecca's got a web page here on DeveloperWorks ibm.biz PowerVC underscore 132. So I've categorized the highlights into four different groups. At the top we have features that work whether you're in Power VM mode with a HMC or if you're in Novalink mode. Then we have some features that only work if you're in Novalink mode. Then we have some expanded SAN storage and finally we have the technical preview. Now the technical preview is looking at the software defined network, quite a powerful feature by the looks of it. I'm not going to cover that in more detail in this session. It is at the moment sort of a standard loan product for you to give a little try if you want. It won't uh, integrate with uh, PowerVC. Some of the features there will be integrated with PowerVC over the next couple of versions. I think the first five items in here are the most important and we'll actually be covering those in more detail in the rest of this video. The other ones I'll just cover briefly here and say no more about. From the top then, the first one, the automatic remote restart, the very powerful feature. If a machine goes down for whatever reason, a problem, or we just shut it down, the virtual machines will automatically be removed and restarted on other machines in PowerVC. Number two is injecting what I call an SSH key on deployment. This means we can put in a current certificate into a deployed virtual machine and we don't have to get the certificate there using some unsecured method later on. Number three, we've got the uh, initiator zoning. This is a different way of doing our zonings that reduces quite a lot the number of zones we have to create. Some our customers are actually running out of zones in their switches. Number four is that we're going to be able to add the text to VM requests. This is where a self-service user actually wants to have a new virtual machine and they can actually explain why to the admin user. And the admin user, typically if they reject it, can explain why back to the self-service user. In the Novalink items, we have the dynamic resource optimizer. Now I won't actually show you how that operates. We can show you switch it on, but we'll actually make some comments about that. The name needs a little bit of explaining. Then we have the ones that we're not going to cover in further detail. We can launch a virtual machine console in Novalink mode. Uh, you probably have to click a few buttons to agree to the Java that you're just about to start up and or get those um, put into your browser as uh, safe things to do. Um, probably not that exciting at the end of the day. Um, when I talk to uh, particular big customers, they already have some procedures and software to get to a dumb console to any particular virtual machine, so you, you may not want to use that uh, feature. For me, I don't have a, a big uh, gorilla security guy in their computer room. I tend to use PuTTY to the HMC and then use VT menu to create my consoles. Next up, Novalink now runs on, on Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And uh, it was only Ubuntu, but of course some customers uh, don't like having multiple flavors of Linux in their computer room. It turns out most of those guys um, actually want Red Hat and they'll license the software from there. So we've done the testing and Novalink now runs on Red Hat. Two things where Novalink is sort of catching up. It now supports the SRIOV devices that we have in some of our Power 8 machines. Um, and also now sh supports the shared storage pool where the power VM mode did but not Novalink so that's a catch-up. On the expanded SAN storage we have uh, the Hitachi data systems uh, driver is now available so we can uh, support existing VMs with that and we also have if you have particular disks I've got a little list of them there the EMC, the Hitachi and two of the IBM disks I have an IBM V7000s or four of them um, so that doesn't help me but we can do the uh, the snapshots and consistency groups if we want to do our backups, for example. Now let's look at those top five in more detail. Automated simplified remote restart, bit of a mouthful. I'm planning a demo video of this for full details, uh, so we'll go through this fairly quickly. This has been arriving for our Power 8 machines um, building up in the last two years. It does require firmware and HMC updates. If you're not on 850 or better yet 860, then uh, I suggest you concentrate on getting your firmware and HMC up to date. 
it, from uh, May this year, we have manual remote restart. We could kick that off from the HMC or from Power VC. Now we have fully automatic remote restart. This comes from the Power VC only. A couple of bits of preparation we need to do first, uh, and I've got a couple of slides on this coming up. First of all, those virtual machines have to be put into SRR ready mode. If we're on the 860 firmware and HMC, we can do that dynamically. On earlier HMCs, we had to actually stop the virtual machine to actually do that as a real pain in the neck. The virtual machines have to be put into priority order. This is an old feature you may have forgotten about. We'll remind you of that. And then we can check on PowerVC that your virtual machines are ready to go. On the HMC 860 and the firmware 860, we can go to the Enhanced Plus graphical user interface and we can click down here, Simplified Remote Restart. It's that easy. Then we need to set the partition availability priority. Again, in Enhanced Plus mode, we select a machine, hit the Actions, View All Actions, and down here we have the partition availability priority. You can then click on the LPOS you want, put a number in here and say Update, and it updates the numbers over in here. You want to set your virtual machine machines and your VO servers in uh, proper priority. The VO servers should be top. Without those, a load of um, LPARs won't actually operate. Then we want our production servers as uh, next priority, then our internal machines perhaps as a lower priority and all the bits and pieces of test and dev and things down as lower priority. Now this was used in the past. If you had a big machine with uh, parts failing, perhaps you had um, eight CPUs fail or something, then it would crush all the LPARs down into the available uh, CPUs that are actually going. But if you lost even more, eventually the hypervisor would say, look, I just can't maintain all these LPARs on what we've got actually left to work on. And so it will actually kill LPARs based on these priorities. Now we're looking at PowerVC. Um, down here, this is a compute template. Down in here, we can click this uh, button in here and we get enabled virtual machine from a restart. This means if we then deploy this image, then it'll automatically be ready for remote restart. If you've got an LPAR that's running, what you're gonna be looking for is these two flags in here. This is the details for a particular virtual machine. And we've got enabled for remote restart and remote restartable. This is good to go. Right down the, right down the bottom, we, have, we can exclude this LPAR or virtual machine. Uh, from automated restart, maybe it's low priority. Then you're going to sit around and wait for an actual incident in your computer room, but you may actually want to sort of induce one so that you can prove to yourself that it's working and gain some confidence. Well, you could yank out the power That is not recommended by IBM. That causes stress on the electrical comp components in the machine. Fortunately, if you go to your HMC and do a server power off, and then ignore any warnings that it will give you about there's things running, are you really sure? Then they'll take you into the right state for remote restart to kick in. Now PowerVC will ignore it for a couple of minutes because it may be thinking you, as an administrator, have stopped the machine and you're going to reboot it in the next couple of minutes. If it goes down and stays down, then it starts in that priority order, moving your virtual machines to other servers in the PowerVC host group. A host group should be a group of machines being used for a similar purpose. You don't really want your virtual machine scattered across your entire computer room. Full speed, I've just got a couple of screenshots in here. Here are my three Power 8 machines uh, up and running. I powered the uh, line machine off on the HMC and we can see PowerVC notices that it's gone off. And a few minutes later, it says, OK, um, got been down long enough, I'm going to do a remote restart rebuild. If we look at the actual virtual machines, we get a slightly different view in here. Here's the three virtual machines that are actually on the line machine. After a few minutes, they go into rebuilding. This is the process of putting these somewhere else. On the HMC here, you can see in here it's not active, not active, uh, and then after a few minutes it's uh, started running again, it's been moved to another machine. Here now we can see back on PowerVC that the three LPOS that we had on the Lime machine are now running on the Ruby machine, and Lime is uh, currently offline. It's put in, into what's called maintenance mode. It's a pretty good name for what's going on. We need to fix it up and get it going again. We can then select the Lime machine um, after we've uh, recovered it and so tell it to exit maintenance mode, and it goes back and it says successfully done that. And then we can have our LPOS moved back to the original machine. So I've clicked on 25, done my great, selecting which machine I want to on and migrate and move them back 
at our leisure. We could also use DRO, the new machine that's come, just come back up, it's completely empty. If any of the other machines get under performance uh, pressure, then DRO, dynamic resource optimization, will kick in and move things to the line machine because there's nothing running on it. It's an obvious target of a place to move busy LPARs to. Number two is injecting an SSH key, or I should call it a security certificate, into a virtual machine when we do a regular deploy of it. When you're doing a deploy, you find a neutral area up in here, key pair none. I was wondering what it was, so I hovered over the question mark, and we can select a key pair to inject SSH credentials during a virtual machine deployment. And we can put this in by looking at the key pairs panel. I thought, well, where's the key pairs panel? Well, if you go up to the top in here, a normally place where we'd log out or change project, here's the uh, key pairs panel. And we get a panel that looks like that when we click on it. If we uh, then do import a key, we can give it a name. We can cut and paste our credentials and say import. And in they go. Then when we come in here, we can see the, the new set of credentials. We can choose which one is going to be squirted into the new virtual machine. This allows us to put those credentials there without using the network, which is a nice high security feature. I'm told in some complex configurations on a SAN, we can actually run out of fiber channel zones in a SAN switch. So PowerVC now optionally offers a new zoning method called initiator zones for fewer zones. Now, fortunately, there's an excellent article here by an IBMer. And I'll put this link on the YouTube page so you can uh, click on it and find it. Um, even I understand this after reading this article. Previously, have 20 LANs and two initiator server endpoints. You get one for every LAN and endpoint pair, so you get 40 of them. Now, with the initiator zoning, the initiator and all its LANs go into one zone, so you can see the drastic reduction in the number of zones. And on to number four. If you're using the Power VC Cloud Manager Edition, then when you make a deployment request as a self service user, you can also send a, a text message and you can get a reply back. Sounds like a small little detail, but uh, it's quite good. So, we're a self service user in here. We're on uh, Project 7, so you can see 7 up in here, and we're going to to deploy where we only got one template so that's the only one we can deploy and when we're doing that we'll see there's a message to administrator box in here and I put Sam Debbie agreed to this on Friday the 13th you are the best techie so you may as well be very polite and hopefully your admin guy will okay your project your request when the admin guy uh, comes in they'll get a little warning up in here that there's one request outstanding in they'll go and we can see a deployment request. If you click on the deploy, see it's still pending in here, the admin guy has to approve or deny it. But if he clicks on it, then we can see here's the message that the self-service user putting into the request. Then we're going to approve it, and they can send back a message back to the user, uh, wishing them all the best. Back to the self-service user, then we can see it's been uh, completed in here. Um, if we click on the deploy, we can go and read the message from the administrator. Now, I've been using it as sort of friendly banter between the two people. Of course, uh, in big organizations, perhaps you'll need, when you create a VM, you know, some project code or department or a financial number or something to actually, uh, who's going to pay the bill for these requests. Very useful feature. Number five, we're looking at the DRO. In the past, it's been used for controlling your CPU use, load leveling it across a group of machines. Uh, now it's going to control memory as well but only if you're using Novalink. The way this is controlled is much like the same as the CPUs. We can see we've got a host group in here and this is the dynamic resource optimizer. These are the um, CPU details in here. And we have another little button in here for memory migrate virtual machines between Novalink managed hosts. So there's a reminder here about the Novalink. So we'll just click the button and then off it will go and do that. But I was thinking about this. If we move uh, virtual machines to balance the RAM across the machines, but we don't add memory to the virtual machine, we don't actually get any performance gain. They've got a certain amount of memory, and if we move it to the machine, well, it's still got the same amount of memory. We need to add memory to a virtual machine that has not enough memory to improve the performance. Let's take a diagram to explain what I mean. The three machines on the left have lots of spare memory. So if a virtual machine requires more memory for performance, I could throw a few gigabytes in instantaneously and we're okay. The three machines on the right have no spare memory. So if one of those becomes bottlenecked due to memory, I can't add a few gigabytes of memory to them. I'd have to, first of all, work out where there is some spare memory, then do live partition mobility to it, and then start growing the 
virtual machine. Now if DRO kicks in and does load leveling of the memory across the machines, there's spare memory in every machine. So regardless of whichever virtual machine has a problem, I can take some of the spare, put it into the virtual machine and get out of my performance problem. If I actually grow a machine up and fill up the machine so that has no spare memory left, of course DRO will kick in again and reshuffle some of the work from that machine to another machine to also spare memory and then again I've got some spare memory on every machine so that I can take quick actions to get out of memory problems. So we're really balancing the free memory across our group of servers so that we can then actually add memory and get better performance. Here's the final chart with a reminder of my highlights in here and that's it for this video. There's five ways to keep up to date, technically. You probably found this on YouTube. Don't forget to click like if you like a good excuse for carrying on, and subscribe if you want to be informed about the next video. You'll also find me on Twitter as Mr. Underscore Nmon, only used for Power and AX a couple of times a week. You'll find all my articles on the AI Expert blog, including hundreds in a back catalogue. And don't forget the two virtual user groups for AIX and Power.